she had me go on a very low carb diet. She gave me a list of about 10 vegetables that I could eat, but I'm very picky. I don't like vegetables. And so there were only like two on the list that I would actually eat and not gag. So I had asked her at the time, like, is it okay if I basically just eat meat? She told me with my iron, she'd actually prefer that I focus on eating a lot of meat because it would be absorbed better. I've told my husband before, I'm so hungry, it hurts. But when I am hungry on carnivore, it's just different. It's a different kind of hungry. There's more to it than just eating steak. Like you can eat hamburger, you can eat pork. It doesn't have to be these expensive cuts of meats. Okay, so today we have a special guest. We have a success story from Jill. Jill, welcome. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. I haven't had my steaks yet for the morning, so I'll be doing better in a couple hours. But other than that, pretty good. It's good to have you. Where are you located? I am in Indianapolis. Okay. I grew up in Indiana, up northwest in there, but been in Indianapolis many times. I have co actually cousins that live there. So good to have another a Hoosier in the house. Tell us a little bit about your background, if you don't mind. I married to my husband. We have two kids and i um, 35 years old. And I don't know if you want me to get into all my stuff that's been going on before carnivore or not, but I was a teacher for a while and I mostly taught kindergarten. I did do first grade for a year and I did reading intervention for kindergarten through second grade for a few years too. Oh. So the little youngins. Okay. Yes. Always worked with the littles. <laughs> and they're still pretty good kids for the most part. Okay. So tell us, so wind us back to, I guess, the beginning, if you don't mind. Okay. So I've pretty much always been a pretty big eater. Even as a kid, I could probably out eat a lot of adults and what I was eating was not great a lot of carbs, standard American diet, all of that. I was chunky as a kid, but later on as like middle school, high school kind of thinned out a little bit just because I was so active. I did color guard and winter guard. When I was 13, I got my period and right away pretty much knew something's different. Something's not the way it's supposed to be. From the beginning, they were pretty much always two weeks long and they were always very heavy. And I'd have a lot of cramps and all that too. So I knew, okay, something's probably off with my hormones. Something's not right, but didn't really know exactly what it was. When I was 17, I went to give blood and found out that my red blood cell count was too low to give blood which at the time I didn't realize it was because I was having these heavy periods, didn't put that all together, but I was basically told eat some spinach and you'll be fine. So got to college and wasn't as active, gained a lot of weight. I was still continuing to have those super long periods. It was miserable. At one point I was trying, I was put on a couple different birth controls. Nothing was really helping. I was having what they call like breakthrough, breakthrough bleeding. So instead of the lasting two weeks, I was having at least light bleeding like for three weeks, which was not fun. So I did that for a few years, tried a different prescriptions, nothing worked. I, by the time I was about 22, I had gotten up to 230 pounds, which I'm 5'11". I am pretty tall, but that's still a lot of weight. And I was told that I was pre-diabetic at that point. So I was told, eat a lot of vegetables, eat fruits, eat whole grains, do all that. So for the next few years, I actually started running. I ran several half marathons and I did what a lot of people do and reduced my calories and substituted a lot of processed foods for things like fruit and vegetables and things like that. A lot of lean meat. And it worked. I did lose weight. I got down to about 180 and I stayed between 180 and 200 for a few years. And then when in 2014, 2015, this all kind of came to a head. My husband and I were getting ready to get married. I went to just any OBGYN, the first one that like came up on the list for our insurance because we weren't planning to have kids right away. 
So I'm like, okay, I need to get on some sort of birth control. So I went and I was going over my history, going over my anemia, how I'd have these super long periods. She got into some of like my family history and there's some infertility, things like that in my family history. And she basically told me, you realize you're not going to get pregnant right away. Like this is not going to be easy for you. And I think I had never had somebody just say it so bluntly um, the way that she said it. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm like, okay. I had told her that we were planning to wait a couple of years, wanted to do traveling, all that. And I was 27 at the time. And she told me, if you wait a couple of years, you're going to be 29. You're going to be, you know, knocking on 30s door. You don't want to be 30 when you're going down this fertility path. So that ended up expediting some things. I think my husband and I decided, okay, I'm not going to go on birth control. I'm, we're just going to not do anything to prevent it. A few months later, I was talking to a friend from church and she recommended a holistic nurse practitioner who specialized in female hormones. So I went to see her in May of 2015. She did all the blood work. Um, I think they took 11 or 12 vials of blood. I did the saliva test, all that tested all the things. And it came back that I had extremely low progesterone. I had um, low cortisol and my testosterone at the time was a little bit on the low side that ended up being more of a problem later. And then my A1C was 8.9 and also my iron was very low and my iron reserves were very low. So she had me go on a very low carb diet, which was no fruit, no grains. She gave me a list of about 10 vegetables that I could eat, but I'm very picky. I don't like vegetables. And so there were only like two on the list that I would actually eat and not gag. So I had asked her at the time, like, is it okay if I basically just eat meat because she had all the meats were on the list and she told me with my iron, she'd actually prefer it that I, I focus on eating a lot of meat because it would be absorbed better. So that was my first introduction to it. She presented it like it was a cleanse. We're going to do this for three months. We're going to get you to a baseline and then we'll go from there. So within those three months, I had my second period during that was seven days, which was abnormal for me. And I thought maybe that's some sort of side effect of something. And then my third period, which I thought was a period was three days and very light. And I had taken a pregnancy test. It was negative. Two weeks later, I was feeling really nauseous and took another pregnancy test and ended up, I was pregnant. <laughs> so that was in August of 2015. And then I ended up having my son in May of 2016. So had a mostly healthy pregnancy. I did have a tough delivery, lost a lot of blood that ended up being an issue later. I probably should have had a blood transfusion, especially with my history of anemia, but it was what it was. We went through all of the fertility stuff again in 2017. We we're trying to get pregnant again. And I was told at one point, because my iron was so low, we need you to just like stop trying because you will miscarry. So I had to work on that first and then went back on the strict, mostly meat, maybe like some spinach or some lettuce here and there, but I would say it's like 95% meat. And I got pregnant in November of 2017 and delivered my daughter in August of 2018. So I continued to stay low carb pretty much. I have a history of, especially around the holidays, binging a bit. I would lose 20 pounds, gain 20 pounds, went back and forth with that. In 2020, I started doing a certain MLMs workouts, which I really did. I got caught up into their nutrition as well. And it ended up, I started having really bad restless leg syndrome. My, it almost felt like I had Tourette's. Like I just could not control like the jerking of like my legs and my body. And we were on vacation and my lips turned blue after running on the beach. I'm like, okay, this is not okay. <laughs> this is not good. And it ended up 
my iron had completely tanked going on that diet, which was about like 1600 calories a day, which like I said, I'm 511. That's not enough. And my testosterone had also completely tanked. So I was put on like 11 different supplements. Some of the supplements were because you have this side effect from this other supplement, you got to take this. And it was just, okay, this is going to be the rest of my life. This is my life. This is just how it's going to be in order to keep all my levels even. So fast forward in spring of 2022, um, I was introduced to the carnivore diet through Ryan Culberson. He and his wife had been keto for several years. I think she like healed her lupus doing keto. And at first I thought it was crazy. I thought it was a rich person's diet because he was basically showing a lot of T-bones, ribeyes. I'm like, that's nice for you, but there's no way I could afford that. And then because I was listening to him talk about it, it just kept popping up more and more on Instagram, like news feeds and Pinterest and things like that. And I started realizing like, there's more to it than just eating steak. Like you can eat hamburger, you can eat pork. It doesn't have to be these expensive cuts of meats. And it sounded very similar to what I had done previously to get pregnant and to balance my hormones. So in late September of last year, 2022, I decided to give carnivore a try just to see, try it out, see if, see if it works. And Within a week, I could tell a difference. I was sleeping a lot better. I just felt like I had more energy. And then two weeks, my husband started noticing a difference in me. He's just said, you just seem like you are, like have like, like a glow about you, like something's different. And then three weeks in, I remember being on a walk and I just had this feeling of, I am unreasonably happy. <laughs> like, I don't, I, I don't know if anxiety has been in my my story, but I've never taken medication for it. I've always thought, oh, I can manage it. And I just remember being on this walk and being like, I don't know why I'm so happy. (laughs) There's a lot of stressors in my life, but it just, you're on that high. So I ended up, I lost 20 pounds within a month. On month two, my period went to seven days, went back to, it went to pretty light. Like it was when we were trying to get pregnant. And I ended up losing 40 pounds altogether, um, 20 pounds the first month, and then 20 pounds slowly after that. And I've just been pretty much following it ever since and experimenting a little bit, but it's just been, I've never done anything like this that has actually changed my health. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. A lot of stuff there. Thank you for that wonderful uh, synopsis there. A couple of just comments on that one. I'm just wondering who this obstetrician you went to back in the day that was wise enough to tell you to focus on meat because that is incredibly helpful. And it's not surprising you're anemic given you said you're bleeding two weeks out of the month and from a 13-year-old kid onward. And so that has to be a little unnerving when you first start that going, what the heck is going on with me? And the other thing is, and I've seen repeatedly now being in this carnivore space for now, getting close to a decade now, a lot of women that, you know, particularly fertility issues, they they seem to do quite well with that. And it seems like it didn't take you very long at all to get pregnant when they're telling you, hey, you may be on this, it may take you years and you're not going to have kiddos. And how surprising was it for you when you like all of a sudden you're pregnant and maybe the expectation was it was going to take months and months and maybe years and IBS and all this fertility stuff. Was that quite surprising to you? It was. And I, yeah, originally the way that she presented it to me was, this is a cleanse. This isn't forever. We're just trying to get you back to a baseline. So I think the way that she had presented it is, I don't expect you to get pregnant by the end of this. And like I said, I ended up missing the pregnancy because I'd had what I thought was a weird period before. I'm like, okay, like the supplements or something doing something. And then two weeks later, I remember sitting at work and I was nauseous all morning. And then the nausea went away. And I'm like, maybe like <laughs> I hadn't been pregnant before. I'm like, I don't know what to look for. I don't know what's normal. And then taking a pregnancy test and yeah, I did not expect it to happen that quickly. I thought, okay, like we're in the long haul here. This is, we're going to get in a baseline. Then we're going to, you know, figure out a treatment from there. And honestly, we went to this holistic nurse practitioner because we weren't really comfortable with IVF plus the cost. 
So not that she, her treatments were cheap, but compared to going down the route of IVF, it actually was a lot less expensive too. Yeah, fair enough. Now you mentioned that she said, here's some meat, have some vegetables. And you said there are only two vegetables you could actually tolerate. What were those two vegetables out of curiosity? Spinach and lettuce. Spinach and so lettuce. So it was broccoli, Brussels sprouts. No, <laughs> I've never been a vegetable person. So that's probably why carnivore works for me well too, because I don't really like vegetables. Yeah, I'm in the same club. I never much cared for them and I don't miss them at all. And people ask me, don't you miss them? No, I don't miss any of that no. stuff. <laughs> I, honestly, I'd rather have a piece of some kind of dessert more so than I'd ever want vegetables. And, and as you, you know, you, you obviously went to this person, you, you ended up getting pregnant. What did you do during your pregnancy? Did you continue to eating a meat rich diet or what did you do at that point? Were you- I actually had a meat aversion during my pregnancy. Once the nausea started, that was really hard. I did try to stick to low carb. With my daughter, my second pregnancy, I ended up having a excess fluid, excess amniotic fluid, which was diagnosed around like week 30. So they really told me to hone it down on the carbs. I think I was doing less than 20 carbs a day with her because the excess fluid was being caused by sugar and all that. My body was breaking out. So I was not anywhere near carnivore on pregnancy. I did try to just limit the sugar. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want to overlook this because you mentioned at some point you came back and you had a hemoglobin A1C of 8.3. And so that would technically make you a diabetic, right? And how did, yep. how was that news received with you? I imagine not good. Did you realize what that meant? Uh, yeah. And honestly, it wasn't too shocking. My dad is diabetic. There's a lot of diabetes in my family on both sides. So it wasn't shocking. I think the only thing that was, is that I had just ran a half marathon, actually I ran two half marathons within six months of that testing. And I had what I thought was, had been eating pretty healthy. So to be told that, hey, you're doing all these things and yet you still have this issue and this issue is causing all these other issues. Yeah, I think that was a little, it was surprising, but yet it wasn't. So I just chalked it up. Well, this is going to be my life. <laughs> this is genetics. This is what runs in my family. You, you said you're running half marathons. You're eating what you thought was healthy at the time. What were you eating when you said you were, thought you were eating healthy? It was a lot more, a lot of salads. I think I was eating at least one salad a day. A lot of lean, it was lean meat, a lot of chicken, but also a lot of fruit and whole grains. I would swap out the white pasta for the whole grain pasta, or I did eat a lot of lean cuisines because I was teaching and it's just easy. So there were some processed foods in there as well, but they were like the healthy processed foods, (laughs) whatever that's called. But it was what had been suggested to me before. It's what most doctors will say, just don't eat a bunch of desserts or whatever. Don't eat a lot of pasta. And it's okay, I can do that. But it obviously wasn't enough. Yeah, it's interesting that you're eating what probably most people would consider reasonably healthy and yet, and running all this way, and yet you're still developing type 2 diabetes. And so how long, when you had that 8.3 diagnosis, did you immediately say, I'm going to shift to something more low carb or how did you go from there? That's when she put me on that low carb diet. And I did, by the time I got tested again, three months later, it had dropped to, it was in the fives. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was within a normal range by the time I got retested three months later. And since you've been carnivore now, at least consistently, like something like a year or so, has that changed in any way? Good, negative, better? Worse? I haven't had it tested since I started, but... I haven't had any issues. I do have a um, one-year appointment coming up in the summer, so we'll see where I'm at, but I don't anticipate it being anywhere near what it has been in the past. Yeah, I'd be surprised if it was eight again. It certainly probably still stay in the fives, I would imagine. But you mentioned you got your peak weight was 230. How much have you managed? I don't, I, forgive me, I don't think I actually caught how much you ended up dropping total and where you're at these days. Right now I'm around like the 170 mark. So when I first started carnivore, I was about 210. So I had creeped back up. So I've lost about 40 pounds, but 
my highest when I was 22 was 230. Yeah, and you said you were at 510, 511, something like that? I'm 511, yeah. yeah so, so 170 for uh, 511 is, tech- is normal. I'm not really trying to lose weight at this point, but it just is slowly still happening. <laughs> so, How did your husband take to these different dietary shifts? Because he's obviously part of this, part of the family, part of the equation, part of what it takes to make kids and stuff like that. So how did that go? Does he come on board or is he just eating whatever he wants? Initially, when I was doing all the fertility stuff, he ate what I ate at home, but would when he was at work or whatever, he just ate fast food or whatever was convenient. And even when I first started carnivore officially this last fall, it was well, eat what you're eating at home. Um, but when he would go out, he would go have fast food. He did try, he did carnivore for 30 days in February. And his biggest thing that he noticed was he, his sleep was great. He stopped snoring within a few days and he had some issues with acid reflux. He had cut out soda from his diet and that definitely helped. He cut out soda a couple of years ago and that had helped, but like acid reflux that was completely gone for the 30 days. So I would say at this point, he's probably about 80%. He doesn't do a lot of fast. He doesn't really do fast food anymore. If he does eat something that's outside of carnivore, it's usually he had a salad or he had whatever, like corn or something like that with meat outside of what he would eat. But at home, we eat the same thing, which is just meat. Yeah, I, I can imagine for just this is snoring is probably, <laughs> you probably appreciate that. I mean, it's, it's something that really, not only is he not sleeping well, but then you're perhaps not sleeping well as as well. <laughs> are you so your kiddos or what are they i mean they're probably not carnivore but are they eating a lot of meat and stuff like that i would say before i made the shift we were definitely living on a lot of goldfish and all the things like you said they are not carnivore but we are making some intentional shifts with them snacking on blueberries instead of snacking on crackers or whatever. So just trying to make some intentional shifts with them. Neither one of them right now are huge meat eaters, which I wasn't as a kid either. I had to learn what I like and how I like it, but we do try definitely harder with them now. (laughs) So not as much mac and cheese, not as many snacks here and there, trying to make more healthy choices and more whole food choices with them. Yeah, it's challenging because, uh, again, as a school teacher, a lot of times kids go to school and they just get exposed to complete garbage. And there's, I don't know if it's still the case, but I know like kids, a lot of teachers are like rewarding kids with pieces of candy for behavior and answering questions. And they have pizza parties and ice cream parties and birthday parties, and it never ends. Was that your experience in the school system you teach that? And then how do you, again, I don't know, I can't remember how old your kiddos are. They're probably what, something like six, five, seven or something like that. Four and six, almost seven, but yeah, like they do have things at school. I think the school that we're at, they do try to do some intention instead of having cupcakes. They had, they did eggs and they did like green eggs and ham and things like that. I know they did like an Easter breakfast too, which was like eggs and fruit. So I think they do try to make some intentional things, but there are birthday parties. There are other things. And I think we just treat it like it's a treat. You're not going to be getting that all day, every day at home. It is a treat and that's it. My kids are not big eaters like I was. They take after my husband more. When we go out to eat, they still share a kid's meal. And I remember being my son's age and thinking a kid's meal wasn't enough. So they're not big eaters at all. They don't get excited over food, which I am thankful for because they definitely don't take after me like I did when I was a kid. But I don't know if they're still around, if, if they're still in the picture, but when you were raised as a kid and when I was raised, my, my parents had, I don't think they really cared one way or the other. I ate plenty of processed food. I grew up on cereal and this is in the 1970s and I, there was some damage done to me. I'm clear as far as my health as I look through the years, but I was able to recover that. Now, one of the problems we have with parents that are conscientious about trying to feed their kids, they go to grandparents' house and it's free for all. Is that, do you run into that some? 
Yes, very much. I think my daughter knows there is a grandparent that always has chocolate milk for her. They've got grandma and grandpa wrapped around their little finger. So yeah, we have run into that as well, that they get more sugar when they're with particularly one grandparent, but (laughs) they know where they can get treats from. Do you know, do you notice when they, uh, a difference in their behavior or their function when they do that stuff? Can you tell they're more grouchy, tired, misbehaved or something like that? I would say I see it more in my daughter. She's four. She can just get very, I don't want to say the word whiny, but yeah, very like grouchy, very tired. Like you can almost see the sugar crash happening. And it'll happen after dinner, right before bed or something like that. And you could just, she just cries. <laughs> she just can't handle herself. She's just, she just cries. So I see it more with her. Did you ever, I'm just wondering, cause you had that, that obviously the diagnosis, at least for a short term period of time, the hemoglobin A1C of 8.3, the, all the uh, menstrual irregularities as you will. Did anyone ever, cons- and obviously gaining weight and things like that. Did anyone ever look up? things like PCOS, was that ever considered part of the differential diagnosis for you? So there was a point where they did an ultrasound and they noticed that my right ovary was covered in cysts, but my testosterone's actually always been low. So I've been told by one medical professional that, oh yeah, if you're over, if your ovaries are have cysts on them, then that's PCOS. And I've had somebody else say, no, your testosterone is actually low. That can't be PCOS. So that's, yeah, I've never had any clarification on that. Have you had a follow-up ultrasound to see if those are resolved? Or? Yes, I did have one would have been like 2020 and that was gone. And actually I was supposed to have surgery after my daughter was born to to remove cysts and they were no longer there. And that would have been 2018 too. And then I had a follow-up in 2020. Yeah. And this is after going on the meat focused cleanses, so to speak. Yes. <laughs> and it's interesting. I've seen a number of women now with PCOS where we actually see resolution cysts go away, symptoms resolve, they lose weight, their testosterone normalizes on and on. So it is interesting to see that. And we typically know that PCOS is highly correlated with insulin resistance or hyperinsulinemia. And one of the drugs often given is metformin. So obviously it's, most of us know it as a diabetic drug, but it's been used in that context as well. And so there's definitely something going on with the whole insulin resistance cascade. So going, I guess you said you taught, are you just staying at home now? And are you planning on homeschooling the kids or how, what are you going to, or are you said they have a school? I do have a little business. I do florals on Etsy. And then I also work right now, or I've been working for our church to help. I work in the kids department, kids ministry. I'm not a pastor. I just do the support work with like curriculum and things like that. So my kids are actually in a private Christian school that is connected to the church, which is really convenient. (laughs) But yeah, they're not, they're not in public school and they're in a school that they really value parents and parents' opinions. They're very parent focused at the school that they're at. Okay. And do you see even within the church, some problems around nutrition? Is it something you ever, do you ever discuss this with anybody else or you just keep to yourself or what are your thoughts around that? It's with the fertility stuff. Like I've told my story, especially to other women who had like similar experiences. I've recommended that nurse practitioner to different people or just things like that. We are in a life group. I know I've shared my story for the most part with with the people in our life group. I've noticed since I've been working at the church, I've only been here for three or four weeks, <laughs> but I noticed like every meeting there is food and it's usually like muffins and all those things too. I'm like, okay, I'm not used to this. So I'll just stick to my coffee. And, but yeah, every, it seems every meeting there's all sorts of things that I'm like, yeah, I, I can't eat that. So <laughs> Yeah, it's common. I can every sort of large social gathering you go to, whether it's a doctor's office or medical conference or really anything, and there's always just it seems like this, and people just mindlessly eating this, you know, whether they want it or not, they just they're drawn to it like moths to a mm-hmm. flame, and it's uh, I think some of that mindless eating and not really hitting any sense of satiety with that often is a real a real problem there. 
you said you're carnivore now. What does that look like for you? Are you eating cheeses and dairy and fatty meats and lean meats or eggs and butter? And what do you do for that? I mostly eat pork and beef. I do eat a little bit of chicken, but that's usually in the form of a drumstick or something like that. I think that is the difference from when I did a meat-based diet when I was trying to get pregnant was I just didn't know about the importance of fat. So back then I was eating a lot of chicken breast, probably about 50% of what I was eating was chicken breast. But now that I know better, I'm sticking to the good stuff, (laughs) but I do eat, I do eat bacon. I tried dairy free for two months and honestly, I really didn't notice a difference. So I put it back in. I do have cheese every once in a while. I'll put some heavy cream in my coffee just to make it a little bit creamier, but I mostly eat beef and pork. Okay. And it sounds like you tolerate them well. And do you, you'd mentioned you saw, was it Ryan Culberson? I think you mentioned it was T-bones and ribeyes and New York strips and all these expensive cuts of meat. And that's not what you necessarily need to do, right? What are you having success with and what relative to maybe your budget before, how does it look now that you're carnivore? So I'm a person that I like to stick to a schedule, stick to certain things. So in our house, our menu usually follows Thursday nights are breakfast. So it'll be like eggs and bacon. Monday nights are usually like the drumsticks or some sort of dark chicken. Wednesdays are like a chuck roast. And then And every night has its own thing. And it usually just depends on what we have going on for the week. If I can just stick something in a crock pot and make it easy and ready to go because it's a busy day. Yeah. And then on the weekends, I do buy either, I'll I'll usually either get a sirloin or a ribeye. It just depends on prices and what's on sale. We shop at Costco and then I also shop at Aldi. Honestly, my, our grocery bill has gone down because we're buying the same things over and over again and I'm buying them on sale. Our Aldi is really good about having 50% off on their meats. So I always double check, make sure, put things in our freezer. So it's honestly probably gone down. We were spending maybe about $200 a week and now we're spending about 130 to 150. Yeah, that's uh, particularly with today's inflated prices, that's for family of four, right? And so that's, mm-hmm. that's probably on par or better than most people are doing. And the amount of nutrition you're actually eating and not the empty meat and junk calories that everybody eats is obviously much, much higher. You said due to some experimentations, have you tried to reintroduce fruits and things like that? Has that been something you've been played with or thought about? I've tried some things here and there. I did notice when I just tried some, I was at a a family get together. I had some strawberries and like my face got really flushed. So I'm like, okay, that's not the greatest reaction. (laughs) Regular milk seems to have, I've, I didn't have heavy cream. So I tried regular milk in my coffee and that kind of has the same reaction. I've had some little things here and there where it's okay. There was probably like a seasoning or there was something that just didn't agree with me. Whether that is, I went to a restaurant and maybe they used seed oil and I didn't realize it. Um, I had an issue when I went to Logan's with their steak. It did all sorts of things to my stomach. And so there's obviously something that they used with their steak that did not agree with me. (laughs) Yeah, that's one of the concerns we go out to dinner is how is it prepared? Are they slathering it in sugar? There's a lot of things you don't know and to make them, to make their food taste good. And sometimes they can mask poor quality products with heavy seasonings and flavor enhancers and things like that to, to, to get you to spend your money. And so I, like I said, I really go out to eat unless I'm traveling and then sometimes you're, you're stuck, but it, I prefer to cook at home. Do you, you'd mentioned you ate a lot of chicken and it's interesting. Most people on a carnivore diet kind of issue chicken. They're like, yeah, I don't really want that stuff. It's too, whatever, it's too lean or it's, it doesn't do for me what things like red meat tend to do and pork being one of the other red meats that we we discussed. But why do you feel that fat is important? What do you mean by you feel it's important? It fills me up a lot more. That's the biggest thing that I notice when I did, I keep calling it the cleanse. That's what she called it. 
When I did that for trying to get pregnant, I was hungry a lot because I wasn't getting enough fats. So once I started realizing like you can eat the same amount of steak that you do chicken and feel so much fuller and it lasts for so much longer, I'm not really ever hungry. And if I am, it's a different kind of hungry. I even know like when I have ate carbs in the past, like I've told my husband, I'm so hungry, it hurts. Like, I don't know how to describe it, but when I am hungry on carnivore, it's just different. It's a different kind of hungry. Yeah, a lot of people notice that it's just, it's more subtle. And it's, you're not, like, like I said, when you have that carb roller coaster and you get to that low and you're really hungry, you'll eat the next thing that walks in front of you. It doesn't matter what it is. It's like, I'll just give me anything. I'm, yeah. And you don't, you kind of have a little more of a subtle and, and you have more time, I think, to, respond to that, which allows us to not make poor decisions with that. You said when you were a little kid, you could put it away. You could out eat, you could out eat most adults. Now you're a normal weight size person. Is that appetite so big like that? Do you still eat more than your husband or do you eat a lot still? Or what's your, as someone who's 5'11", 170, how much are you eating on a daily basis? Would you guess? I would say before carnivore, I was definitely eating at least 3000 calories a day. I've done intermittent fasting. I was already doing that before I became carnivore. I'm just not a big breakfast person, never really was, but I still, even before carnivore, I still had these periods of, I could binge eat. I could just keep going and going. And if it was something that I really wanted, then I will find room for it. And it wasn't uncommon for me to gain 15 pounds in the month of December because it's just all these treats and all these dinner parties and things like that. Um, Now I eat basically two meals a day. I eat lunch and I eat dinner. Usually lunch is leftovers from the dinner before. And I'm probably eating about, it depends on what it is, maybe eight to 10, maybe 12 ounces of meat when I eat. Sometimes I'll have a slice of cheese on something or I'll, in between meals, I might snack on a pork rind or a slice of cheese or something like that. But I'm definitely not eating as much as I was. And I noticed going through the holiday season this last year, because that was my first time going through the holiday season as a, like following carnivore, um, I didn't gain any weight whatsoever. It was actually a lot easier than I thought it would be. I was a little nervous going into December, but I was determined. (laughs) I had a family member tell me like, you can't do that. And for the holidays, I'm like, okay, watch me. So I was determined to get through it. And it honestly was easier than I thought it would be like there, any family gathering, you're going to have choices. So it's just making those right choices. Yeah. I think that's the point. There can be a good choice. If you go to a big gathering hell i just bring your own what i'll yeah. do is i'll eat a pre-eat i often do that because i'm like oh there's probably not gonna be enough for me to eat anyway and i eat a lot and so i'm three thousand calories for me is like, yeah that's a kind of a, that's a meal type of thing <laughs> in many cases but yeah you can always make a there's almost i won't say always but there most often is a good choice and if unless you were going to some crazy vegan get together which i don't know why you'd want to do that but if you did you could always pre-eat and and then you can just kind of chill out and just socialize and a lot of a lot of going out to eat is more about the social side of it than the actual food mm-hmm. itself. Often the food is overpriced and doesn't taste as good as what you can produce at home on your own if you know how to cook. And that's something that uh, is important. Were you growing up as a kid and, uh, you know, I guess what you grew up like in the nineties, I'm guessing something like mm-hmm. that. Did yeah. you, were you a skilled, skillful cooking person? Were you good in the kitchen? Or have you gotten better in that? Or how were you at that? I definitely grew up My grandma was amazing in the kitchen, but her specialty was chicken noodles and mashed potatoes. I definitely learned how to make all the casseroles, all the carb foods. So learning even just grilling and things like that, that was more of when I became an adult. And I think even just when I've when I started doing carnivore, started adding more meats in, that's when I started experimenting more with using the crock pot to roast or using different methods or using an air fryer or whatever. So I think that's been a little bit later, but I did at least grow up with the base of knowing my way around the kitchen, enjoying cooking. I do enjoy it. 
but it is a lot simpler now because there's not a million steps. I'm literally either just sticking something in an air fryer or the oven or grilling it on top of the stove or whatever. So it's a lot easier. Yeah, I, you, you didn't mention the one area where it still seems for some reason there's this sort of skewing, a male, uh, sort of a male dominant skew is out on the barbecue grill. Because it's most of the time it's the guy out there barbecuing and I'm happy to do that. I'm quite <laughs> adept at that. But I wonder why that is. Do you feel that? Do you feel intimidated? Do you even have a barbecue grill? Do you feel intimidated by it? Do you like doing that? Do you like the way it tastes? What are your thoughts around we, the grill? We do. That's where my husband... And honestly, last year, we really didn't grill that much other than if we were at somebody else's house. He did like stuff on their grill. I don't know why last year we really didn't do much, but that's always been his thing. I probably do 90% of the cooking in our house, but the grill and the griddle are his area. So... (laughs) It's funny how we have that that little dichotomy. And that's the case for me. My my significant other, she... I don't think she even knows how to turn the grill on. And I'm out there I'm just every day, two, three times a day out there, I'm out there grilling steaks and smoking, smoking tri-tips and briskets and things like that. And it's kind of, so how do your, what do your parents think now? Cause they saw you growing up. They saw you gaining a bunch of weight. Are they glad for you? Do they think you're crazy? Are they like, what the hell are you doing? What's going on with you folks? I think both. My mom especially has been a worrier, I would say. She was the ones like, you can't do that during the holidays. <laughs> but I think she has seen a change in me. I think having my husband to advocate for me as well and saying, I'm seeing the change. Like I'm seeing all these things in her and she's doing this and that. I think, I think some of it too was that there was this thought of it's either going to make it harder for them because they feel like they have to make something special for me, which I've always said, let me, I can bring my own food. It's fine. Or it's just, I think I grew up in a family too, where they would, they diet, but then you have cheat days. And I think the fact that I wasn't, I've not been having cheat days. I'm not doing that. I've been pretty consistent. I've had a couple things here and there testing out, but I think there's that expectation of like, when is the cheat day coming? But I think overall they've seen the health benefits and And I told my mom too, that I'm open to experimenting with some things. She knows that I experimented with dairy and my mom does low carb for the most part too. But yeah, I definitely grew up in a family where it's, oh yeah, you follow this diet, but then you have this cheat day, like you plan your cheat days. And I think that's how everyone in my family has always just done it. Yeah. That's one of the funny things I, people often ask me, how many cheat days can you have? When can you cheat? What do you cheat with? It's just, it's a foregone conclusion that you must do this. And if you don't do that, if you don't participate in this sort of, and Christmas is a time where many people do, they fall off their diets, they do that. And a lot of people just relax and have this stuff. And if you don't do that, then they feel like it reflects negatively on them. And you're somehow judging them when you're just like, look, I'm just leave me alone. Let me do what I want to do. And you eat, if you want to stuff your face with whatever pecan pie and desserts up the wazoo, then go for it. It's up to you. But uh, again, I guess it's one of those things where nobody likes to drink alone. It's alcoholics always like to drag somebody in with them. And I think we see the same thing with some of these food addicts, sugar addicts, junk food addicts. They they want a friend to enjoy it. Sometimes, sometimes they're happy to sneak alone in the middle of the night and gorge on cookies and things like that. Did you ever have any issues with them? Did you ever try to do this healthy diet and then fall in cravings yes. binges and stuff like that. A lot of women do. Because I see these women that are often, and I, I don't want to pick on women, but women tend to fall more prey to the societal pressures to be super skinny and eat all these salads all the time and restrict the fat so much. And then it's like when no one's looking, there's like, gosh, just give me some ice cream. That Was that ever part of your experience? Oh, yeah. Like I said, like I could binge with the best of them. And some of it was, and it's funny because I've had my, my mother-in-law made a comment to me like, Oh, you're so disciplined. You're, and this was before carnivore. And she's like, you're so disciplined. You're so this, you're so that. And like, you don't know what happens, you know, at night in my home by myself, when there's a box of cookies, so you just hide that part of it. But, and I also know too, my husband and I went to Fogo de Chao back in November for our anniversary because all the meats and they don't, their bacon, they don't label it as like maple or honey or something, but it's got something on it. And so I had a bite of their bacon and it was like, something got triggered and it took me about a week to get that craving out of my system just from eating like 
not even half a piece of bacon that I don't even know what it had on it, but I could just feel that being triggered. So I think that's probably been a big reason why I'm like, I don't want to cheat. I don't want to have those days because I know things get triggered and then you fall into that pattern. And the next thing you know, you fall, you fall completely off. Yeah. I will speak to that because I've been to Fogo de Chow. I mean, they sat me right next to the salad bar where literally, and the bacon was right there within arm's reach. So I reached over and grabbed some while I was waiting and I tasted it. And it was like, is candy bacon is what it is. And so it is, it's really, holy cow, this is good. Yeah. And I think one of the problems, we just seen a recent study that shows that when you start eating fatty and sweet foods together, it actually rewires your brain a little bit and you start, and then you just want to eat more and more of that. That's why it's so addictive. And it is something that the food industry knows this extremely well. Their scientists actually try to create stuff like this that becomes so addictive. And so they know this whole Lay's potato, but you can't eat just one. You're right, because you can't. And when you start, like I said, that's why sometimes carnivore has been so helpful for so many people because you eliminate, pretty, you potentially eliminate everything. And it is, if you're, again, I use the analogy, if you tell a heroin addict, we want you to quit, but you can have, you can shoot up once a week on that. This doesn't work very well. We know that. So for particularly those people whose brains have been wired or rewired to be highly addictive, that is something that it doesn't work real well. Let me ask you about, you, you said you're working at the church, you got your kiddos, family. Are you, do you ever participate in social media stuff? Is that part of where you go? Or I am a part of two different women-only, ladies-only carnivore groups on Facebook. I think I'm also part of the Zeroing In on Health World Carnivore Tribe. I think that's, I get a lot of inspiration from those. And the women's when a lot of people like the women will ask about hormones and things like that. And I feel like at this point, I can at least speak to that a little bit. So there'll be questions about pregnancy and hormones and fertility and stuff like that. And then, yeah, like just following different people on Instagram, getting inspiration. I think when it's in front of you, it makes it a lot easier. So listening to podcasts and things like that too, it just when you focus in on it, it just, it makes it easier. I'm glad to hear that the zeroing in on health Facebook group is still around. That's where I first learned about carnivore, by the way. And I, I always thank those people that, that did that, that they put that out there. So it was at least whether you agree or disagree, at least that was information that you could access. And then World Carnivore Tribe, I actually started myself. That's actually mine, although I don't spend any time on Facebook because <laughs> I didn't like Facebook, but I'm glad that's still going good and you're doing that. And have you had, this is one of the problems with social media is one, it can be a good source for information. It can be a source of a lot of negativity though. Do you see much of that? Or are you exposed to that? Do anybody ever attack you for just saying, Hey, I'm trying to eat healthy and this has helped my health. Have you gotten any negativity thrown your way with that? Not on social media, but I have had just people in my life question, what are you eating? Why are you doing that? That seems really extreme. But I really, I haven't put a ton out on social media other than like maybe putting some stuff in my stories about this is what I ate today or, you know, this is my lunch or something. I've reposted a couple of things, but I haven't put a lot out there to the world about what I'm doing. I think people are noticing that there's a difference. Like I bought, I obviously look like I've lost weight and I've had people ask me, what are you doing? But I haven't put a lot of that on social media. What would be, if you could say, this is going to be like my dream carnivore, what would, what would that be? What would it look like to you? Probably a ribeye with bacon on top. <laughs> <laughs> bacon is like my version of a dessert, so especially like a thick cut bacon. So that's, I love ribeye, which my husband doesn't really like ribeye, but I do. And then, yeah, maybe cook it in some bacon grease and have a little bacon on top. And I think that would be my perfect meal. I, I think a lot of people would agree with you on that. I certainly love my ribeye steaks. And people ask me if I ever have, if I ever get a cheat meal. I said I'm cheat just about every day because I'm eating ribeyes and other steaks. <laughs> every day is a cheat day for me, so I'm pretty fortunate in that regard. I got to tell you, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you for doing this. You're just a, such a, just a happy, I can see you're just happy, smiling all the time. And that's good. And always, uh, I find a lot of people in the carnivore community generally to be generally happier than the average person. I think there's something to it. And there's actually some science behind that shows that red meat has a lot of things that make us happy. And so good for you. You don't, you're on those Facebook groups. You don't have your own webpage. You said you, you're a 
floral, you, what, a floral yeah. designer or floral, you, guys fly, you put flowers together for, was it Etsy, I think, something like Etsy, that? Etsy, yeah. I do have an Instagram. It's just Jill M. Bloom, B-L-U-M-E. And I do put my, my shop name is called Ellie and K Designs. I'm on Etsy and I do garlands, wreaths, that kind of stuff. I've worked on the side for a wedding planner for the last seven, eight years. And I learned a lot about floral design from her. And I've just taken that and made a little shop out of it. And is that primarily for just local in Indiana or do you do those things no. nationwide? Etsy is pretty much anywhere in the U.S. But yeah, it's Ellie and K Designs on, on Etsy. Ellie and K Designs? Okay, if somebody's looking for some floral stuff, there's where to go. Jill, thank you so much for doing this. Appreciate it. The rest of you guys have a great day. Once again, we've got Chris Kenobi, Dr. Chris Kenobi coming at 1 o'clock today. Hopefully, I'll see some of you guys back there. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you later. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Hey, folks. It's Dr. Sean Baker here. If you guys are enjoying these success stories, you can become your own success story. You can do that by heading over to carnivore.diet. You can sign up for a free 30-day trial and get started today. We're looking forward to supporting you. Our community is wonderful, and we'd love to see your success.